Welcome to the Darden Fiscal Year 2022 First Quarter Earnings Call. Your lines have been placed on listen only until the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star 1 on your touchtone phone. The conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Kevin Kalakak. You may begin. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for participating on today's call. Joining me on the call today are Gene Lee, Darden's Chairman and CEO, Rick Cardenas, President and COO, and Raj Vanam, CFO. As a reminder, comments made during this call will include forward-looking statements as defined in the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations and projections. Those risks are described in the company's press release, which was distributed this morning, and in its filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We are simultaneously broadcasting a presentation during this call, which is posted in the Investor Relations section of our website at Darden.com. Today's discussion and presentation will include certain non-GAAP measurements, and reconciliations of these measurements are included in the presentation. Any reference to pre-COVID when discussing first quarter performance is a comparison to the first quarter of fiscal 2020. This is because last year's results are not meaningful due to the pandemic's impact on the business and the limited capacity environment that we operated in during the first quarter of fiscal 21. We plan to release fiscal 2022 second quarter earnings on Friday, December 17th, before the market opens, followed by a conference call. This morning, Gene will share some brief remarks on the first quarter results. Rick will give an update on our operating performance, and Raj will provide more detail on our financial results and an update of our fiscal 22 financial outlook. Now, I'll turn the call over to Gene. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning, everyone. As you saw from our release this morning, we had a very good quarter. Our teams continue to operate effectively in a challenging environment, and I'm proud of their focus and ability to deliver another quarter of strong sales and profitability. All of our segments delivered record first quarter profit. Our ability to drive profitable sales growth is a testament to the strength of our business model and our continued adherence to the strategy we implemented six years ago. Our brands remain laser focused on executing our back to basics operating philosophy anchored in food, service, and atmosphere, while at the Darden level, we concentrate on strengthening and leveraging our four competitive advantages of significant scale, extensive data and insights, rigorous strategic planning, and our results-oriented culture. Our first quarter sales trends started strong as momentum carried over from the fourth quarter, and they further strengthened and peaked in July. However, in August, sales slowed due to the impact of the Delta variant but remain positive relative to pre-COVID levels. For the first quarter, sales per operating week were up 4.8% relative to pre-COVID. And through the first three weeks in September, sales per operating week were up approximately 7% relative to pre-COVID. Regardless of the operating environment, our unwavering commitment to our strategy ensures we'll stay focused on what we do best, providing exceptional guest experiences. Throughout this unique period, our operators have shown tremendous flexibility while remaining locked in on the fundamentals of running great restaurants. At the same time, our focus helps us continue to find ways to make our competitive advantages work even harder for us. One of the ways we do this is by leveraging our ability to open value creating new restaurants. We opened seven new restaurants during the quarter, all of which are exceeding our expectations and we remain on track to open approximately 35 to 40 new restaurants this fiscal year. A long-term framework calls for 2 to 3% sales growth from new restaurants. Given our strong, stronger unit economics, our development team is working hard to build out a pipeline of locations for fiscal 23 and beyond that would put us at or above the higher end of our framework. Before I turn it over to Rick, I want to thank our team members in our restaurants and our support center. As I visit our restaurants and talk with our teams, I'm constantly reminded why our people are our greatest competitive advantage. Their passion for being of service to our guests and each other fuels our success. Rick? Thank you, Gene, and good morning, everyone. Our success this quarter was driven by the work we have done to simplify our processes and our menus to drive execution at the highest level. 
We also paused any new initiatives in order to further eliminate distractions for our restaurant teams and allow them to focus on what it takes to run 14 great shifts a week. In addition, to-go sales continue to benefit from the ongoing evolution of our digital platform. This platform makes it simpler for our guests to visit, order, pay, and pick up, all while making it easier for our teams to execute at the highest level, both in the dining room and off-premise. This served our teams well as to-go sales remained high through the quarter. For the quarter, off-premise sales accounted for 27% of total sales at Olive Garden and 15% of total sales at Longhorn Steakhouse. Digital transactions accounted for 60% of all off-premise sales during the quarter, and guest satisfaction metrics for off-premise experiences remain strong. As we navigate short-term external pressures, our focus is simple. We must continue to win when it comes to our people and product. From a people perspective, the employment environment is challenging. That's why our top priority during the quarter was staffing our restaurants. Our operators and HR teams have done a great job sourcing talent. We recently launched a new talent acquisition system that helps increase our pool of candidates by allowing applicants to apply and schedule an interview in five minutes or less. Additionally, our brands are successfully utilizing their digital platforms, including social media, to promote our employment proposition and drive applications. As a result, we are netting more than 1,000 new team members per week, and our team member count is approximately 90% of our pre-COVID levels. The biggest operational challenge we've been dealing with is the temporary exclusion of team members identified through contact tracing. Given our commitment to health and safety, we are diligent about exclusions, but they create sudden staffing disruptions for our operators. Despite being appropriately staffed in the majority of our restaurants, these exclusions reduce the number of available team members with little notice for our operators to prepare. This volatility can negatively impact sales in these restaurants for the duration of the exclusion period. Getting and staying staffed also requires a fo strong focus on training. As we continue to hire, it is critical that we have the right training in place to ensure we continue to execute at a high level. That's why our operations leaders are validating the quality of our training during their restaurant visits ensuring new, tem new team members receive the appropriate amount of training and successfully complete the required assessments. Our team members are the heart and soul of our business, and we are constantly focused on our employment proposition. The investments we have made and continue to make in our people are helping us retain and attract top talent, and I am confident in our ability to address our staffing needs. When it comes to product, our significant scale including our dedicated distribution capabilities, enables us to manage through the challenges affecting the global supply chain and maintain continuity for our restaurants. Our supply chain team continues to work hard to ensure we successfully manage through any spot outages we encounter and our restaurants have the key products they need to serve our guests. During the quarter, we had to secure more product than usual on the spot market because our brands exceeded sales expectations and some of our suppliers experience capacity challenges. Raj will share more details in a moment, but these higher sales volumes, as well as freight costs, have contributed to higher than expected inflation. Our scale advantage provides the opportunity for us to price below our competition and inflation, which is a strategy we have executed successfully. Our competitive advantage of extensive data and insights allows us to be surgical in our pricing approach, positioning us well to deal with these higher costs and maintain our value leadership. The rich insights we gather from our analytics help us find the right opportunities to price in ways that minimize impact to traffic over time. We still expect pricing to be well below the rate of inflation for the year, further strengthening our value proposition. Ensuring our restaurants are appropriately staffed and our supply chain continues to avoid significant disruptions will be the most important factors of our continued success in the short term. To wrap up, I also want to recognize our outstanding team. I'm inspired by the dedication and winning spirit that our leaders and team members, both in our restaurants and in our support center, continue to demonstrate. Thanks to each of you for all that you do to continue to create exceptional experiences for our guests. Now I'll turn it over to Raj. Thank you, Rick, and good morning, everyone. Total sales for the first quarter were $2.3 billion, 51% higher than last year, driven by 47.5% same restaurant sales growth and the addition of 34 net new restaurants. 
diluted net earnings per share from continuing operations were $1.76. We returned approximately $330 million to our shareholders this quarter, paying $144 million in dividends and repurchasing $186 million in shares. We had strong performance this quarter despite increased inflationary pressures, with EBITDA of $370 million and EBITDA margin of 16%, 250 basis points higher than pre-COVID. Our sales results were better than expected, requiring us to go out and purchase more product on the spot market. In particular, proteins, as our longhorn and fine dining segments had the largest sales outperformance versus our expectations. The market for proteins this quarter was very strong, with spot premiums as high as 30% above our contracted rates. This resulted in higher average cost per pound for our proteins, contributing to total commodities inflation for the quarter of approximately 5.5%. Given the heightened attention on inflation, I want to clarify that we use a conventional approach to calculating the rate of inflation. We're only measuring change in average price holding product mix and usage constant. We follow the same approach for calculating wage inflation rate in which we keep the hours and job mix constant and only look at change in wage. While we expect higher rates of inflation to persist for the remainder of the year versus what we initially planned, we believe our scale and recent enhancements to our business model enable us to deliver significant margin expansion while still adhering to our strategy of pricing below inflation. Now, looking at the P&L for the first quarter of 2022, we're providing a comparison against pre-COVID results in the first quarter of 2020, which we believe is a more comparable, more comparable to normal business operations and with how we've been talking about our margin expansion. For the first quarter, food and beverage expenses were 150 basis points higher driven by investments in both food quality and pricing significantly below inflation. Restaurant labor was 110 basis points lower, driven primarily by hourly labor improvement due to efficiencies gained from operational simplifications and was partially offset by elevated wage pressures. Restaurant expenses were also 110 basis points lower due to sales leverage. Marketing spend was $45 million lower, resulting in 220 basis points of favorability. As a result, restaurant level EBITDA margin for Darden was 20.9%, 290 basis points better than pre-COVID levels. DNA expense was 30 basis points higher, driven primarily by approximately $10 million of stock compensation expenses related to the immediate expensing of equity awards for retirement eligible employees. Additionally, we had approximately $5 million of expense related to mark to market on our deferred compensation. As a reminder, uh, as a reminder due to the way we hedged this expense, it's largely offset on the tax line. These impacts were partially offset by savings from corporate restructuring implemented in fiscal 2021. Our effective tax rate for the quarter was 12.6%, which benefited from the deferred compensation hedge I just mentioned. Excluding this benefit, our effective tax rate would have been closer to the top end of our guidance range for the year. Turning to our segment performance, first quarter sales at Olive Garden were flat to pre-COVID, while segment profit margin increased 220 basis points. This was strong performance despite elevated inflation and two-year check growth of only 2.4%. Longhorn had the best sales performance across our segments with sales increasing by 26% versus pre-COVID while growing segment profit margin by 250 basis points. Sales at our fine dining segment increased 24% versus pre-COVID in what's traditionally their slowest quarter from a seasonal perspective. Segment profit margin grew by 490 basis points, driven by strong sales leverage and operational efficiencies, which more than offset double-digit commodity inflation. Our other segment grew sales by nearly 5% and segment profit margin by 360 basis points. We continue to be excited about the long-term prospects of this segment as it's driving the strongest underlying business model improvement of all our segments. Finally, Turning to our financial outlook for fiscal 2022, based on our performance this quarter and expected performance for the remainder of the year, we increase our outlook for the full, full year. We now expect total sales of $9.4 billion to $9.6 billion, representing growth of 7% to 9% from pre-COVID levels. 
Same restaurant sales growth of 27% to 30%, 30% and 35 to 40 new restaurants. Capital spending of $375 million to $425 million. Total inflation of approximately 4%, with commodities inflation of 4.5%, and total restaurant labor inflation of 5.5%, which includes hourly wage inflation of about 7%. EBITDA of $1.54 billion to $1.6 billion, an annual effective tax rate of 13% to 14%, and approximately 131 million diluted average shares outstanding for the year, all resulting in diluted net earnings per share between $7.25 and $7.60. This outlook implies EBITDA margin growth versus pre-COVID in line with our previous outlook as higher sales are helping offset elevated inflation. Before we open it up for questions, I want to remind you about a calendar shift next quarter. Thanksgiving falls in our fiscal second quarter this year, whereas it was in the fiscal third quarter pre-COVID. This will be a net negative to second quarter from a sales perspective. Now we'll take your questions. As a reminder, please press star 1 to ask a question. In order to allow all participants the opportunity to ask a question, we ask that you limit yourself to one question with one follow-up. Thank you. And our first question today comes from John Glass of Morgan Stanley. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Um, Jean or, or um, Weber, could you please first just talk about the, the impact of uh, the reduction of couponing at, at Olive Garden? I, I think that probably has adversely impacted sales. It obviously has a huge positive impact on margin. But can you just sort of quantify what you think the foregone sales were for that? So as we think about that brand versus peers, we have the right context. Yeah, let me, let me take let me take a stab at this a little broader, John, and just just the coupons because I don't, I'm not sure we we can get right to the number that you're looking for. I, mean, I think the coupon number probably was about one percent of sales, um, and so you know trying to 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 say okay, what's that? What's that driving guest count? I think that's a little bit harder to get at. Um, when I look at that line, the P&L, it's about it was about one percent. Let me just put Olive Garden's performance in, in context for everybody. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with their performance. Um, you know, we only have two and a half percent check in, in, in the business over the last two years. Uh, that's compared to you know a little over five for the industry. I mean, that's a strategic choice that we continue to make, and we think it's the, it's the right choice. Uh, if you just assume that the marketing was break-even, I mean, you've got to add another 10 points to the sales, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, basically they're, they're, they're flat, flat-ish, and then you, t you take out that marketing, um, you know, that, that's a big number. Um, the other thing, and then Rick alluded to this in his script, I mean, you know, we're still struggling from a, from a tr uh, staffing standpoint, um, primarily because of the exclusions, um, and if you think about that, that's limiting our sales. And, and it's just, a, in the way I think about it, it's just another way of, of capacity limitation. You know, just, you know, if you, if you, if you just think about it, we, you know, on average, I guess we have one or two sections closed in most of our restaurants most nights. Um, so we're losing six to eight tables. So there's, especially in Olive Garden, that, that's, you know, that's, that's putting a, a cap on what we can do for sales. So when I think about the overall, like when I sum up Olive Garden's performance, I just think that we're, you know, we're, we're doing unbelievable. We've got a 23.2% restaurant level earnings percentage. Our profit grew $25 million over pre-COVID. Um, this is just, a, this is an impressive business. And we're just, you know, we're reevaluating over time how we're going to take this, this business to market. Um, when we think about couponing, we think about overall promotional activity and full marketing. Thank you for that. And if I could just ask one follow-up, Raj, on your commodity comments, it sounds like you would still expect maybe better commodity inflation later in the year. Do you have better visibility than you did before? I mean, what, what would prevent you from having to go to the spot market more often if sales continue to go? How much visibility do you have on that inflation for, for the full year now versus last quarter? Uh, sure, John. Let me start by saying, you know, we, we have, we, I, you saw us, we, we increased our forecast for sales, so that gives us a little bit uh, of, uh, you know, I guess, uh, less need 
to have to go back into the market than what we're already anticipating. So some of that increased sales impact is baked into our estimate. As we look at Q2 and Q3, we have, we have more visibility clearly into a lot more into Q2 and, and, and some decent visibility into Q3. Q4 is one that's probably, we'll have to figure out you know, where things you know, shake out, but we, do, we did have higher inflation last year in Q4. But all in all, you know, the way we're thinking about it is you know, Q1, we had about five and a half. We have about 80% contracted for Q2. Uh, based on the updated volume, uh, and then for Q3, I think we have around 60% contracted out, so we feel pretty good about that. You know, could there be some movement? Absolutely, but I think that's where you know we we showed you I think in, in the first quarter how we have the ability to manage through that. I mean, I think the the fact I mentioned about the business model improvements, as well as other levers we have at our disposal, are, are at our disposal to help us manage through that uh, fairly well. And our next question comes from Andrew Charles of Cohen. Great. Rick, I appreciate the commentary around the labor and staffing challenges. You know, what have you seen over the last two weeks since that $300 a week supplemental unemployment insur insurance expired? Has this been as large of a tailwind as you previously anticipated? And perhaps you can speak to what you're seeing in states that curtail benefits earlier this summer as a leading indicator. And then I have a follow-up. Thanks. Yeah, Andrew, thanks for the question. Um, you know, what I would say is we've done a lot of things to help increase staff flow or applicant flow, and one of those that I talked about was the, the new system we put in place. We haven't really seen a dramatic change in staffing flow from when we put that new system in place to when the unemployment benefit started to, to, to eliminate. So we think we've been getting staffing flow even before that happened. Um, you know, we have, as, as we said, staffing challenges, and the, the challenge is a little bit more in certain parts of the country, um, but not necessarily driven by unemployment benefits. It's just driven by when they've opened up versus not when they've opened up. Um, we, we are, we're not so worried about um, getting great applicants because we are getting them right now. Yep. And then my follow-up question is that you've called out prior to the pandemic that Olive Garden could reach 20% of sales off-premise. And obviously, with the rebound in the dining business, you know, you're seeing that off-premise mix you know, come down a bit. You know, still sticky, um, you know, now accounting for about 27% of the brand sales. Do you think this is a fair mix of, of sales that you can sustainably see going forward, or is it likely to further come down um, as staffing challenges ultimately ease and you can fulfill more on-premise dining? Yeah, Andrew, I, I still think that the uh, off-premise mix will come down at Olive Garden and at Longhorn um, <clears throat> as the dining rooms continue to fill and people feel more comfortable going out to eat in a restaurant. Um, we were starting to see that um, some when, when COVID was winding down uh, before the Delta variant, variant spiked. We were starting to see our percent of sales go down. Um, and then when the Delta variant, variant spike came, in, came, on, came back, um, we started to see that percent go back up. So we don't believe that 27% is where we'll be um, in the immediate long term after, after COVID is over. Um, we still think somewhere in the 20s, um, but that all depends. I and mean, we've made a lot of great investments in our technology. We've made it easier for our team members to, to, to handle all of, the, all of the orders. We've made it easier for our guests to order, to pay, to do the things that I mentioned in the earnings, in the call. Um, and so we do believe that our to go as a percent of sales is going to be greater than it was, be, than we ever thought it would be before before COVID. That's because we're getting a lot of people that have come to Olive Garden and to Longhorn that hadn't done that, hadn't done to go before. So, and they're getting a great experience. Very helpful. Thank you. If you find that your question has been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing star two. The next question today comes from Jared Garber of Goldman Sachs. Thanks for taking the question. Um, obviously, the, the Longhorn trends remain very robust, um, and I think it was really encouraging to see the fine dining segment uh, turn positive this quarter. Um, can, you, can you talk about what you're seeing in terms of pent-up demand and consumer trade-up? It seems like the state category remains uh, really strong, maybe even relative to some of the other brands, and I wonder if um, some of that trade-up is sort of, you know, not benefiting uh, Olive Garden as much uh, despite some of the reduced promo activities in that brand. 
Yeah, I think that might be overthinking it just a little bit. I mean, the steakhouse category has been, you know, strengthening, you know, even be pre-COVID, strengthened through COVID. Uh, I think that, you know, Longhorn, as, as we've discussed, has benefited somewhat from a uh, ge geographical uh, footprint that has been, uh, you know, when you think they're, they're footprint heavy, heavy uh, Georgia, heavy Florida. Um, I also think that we've made a lot of investments in Longhorn over the last five or six years, and I think they're really, you know, they've 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 come through. I would also say that operating these these smaller footprints um, has been easier through a little bit easier through COVID. We need a lot less employees to run a Longhorn. I think we're you know we're we're you know fully you know basically fully staffed in that business, uh, and, and so I think it's all come together and uh, running real well. As far as fine dining goes, uh, I mean, we're, we're thrilled to see the level, the sales volumes we did uh, this summer in fine dining. I will tell you that, you know, there's still a heavy drag on fine dining in, in the major cities. We're still down 40% uh, in our three Manhattan locations, a little bit less than that in the other major cities. But we're seeing a, you know, a big uptick in suburbia in fine dining, um, which has been fantastic. And so that business has been, you know, robust. I, I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd see the kind of absolute numbers that we saw this summer in, in fine dining, which has been fantastic. So I think there's some celebratory out there. I think that I think people who aren't traveling for business as much as they used to are using fine dining restaurants maybe a little bit more on the weekend, um, which has been great to see. And I think the only other thing that I would say on fine dining is, Sundays become a, a, a legitimate sales day in fine dining, which was really, you know, pre-COVID kind of a throwaway day, in most, unless you were in a convention city and the, and the convention started on Sunday. Uh, but Sunday is a real legitimate day now, which is taking, operationally, it's taken some adjustments for us to get used to. Thanks. appreciate the call there. And I just wanted to follow up on the, on the unit growth commentary that you made earlier, Gene. I think it was really encouraging to hear that you'll, you'll likely be ahead of that at the top end or ahead of that um, 2 to 3 percent range in 23. Can you talk a little bit about the, the adjustments or the impacts you've seen in the, the other segment and maybe some of the opportunities coming out of the pandemic in that segment for the restaurants within there? Yeah, I think the biggest the biggest impact has been when we transform those business models, and we've we've talked about the transformation we've made it at Cheddar's. Uh, also, Bahama Breeze had a, a significant transformation there. Um, we're, we're doing some good work in, in Yard House. Uh, we're making some more investments in the food. Uh, we, we've got that business model in a, in, a, in a good place, so we think there's you know good outsized, hopefully good growth in, in that business. So. We have a lot more confidence in investing uh, new capital into the into these segments. I mean, we've also, I mean, Seasons is another business that's that's really made significant improvement. Uh, so that we're confident to reinvest in that business. So as the real estate becomes available, um, we have more options. We're confident in more options to use uh, that that real estate. So if we go into a market where we already have a great Olive Garden, a great Longhorn. Um, we have we have we have a we have a property or a brand that we can put on top of that great piece of real estate and, and, and confident that we're going to get a really good return from that. And so it's given our it's given our real estate and development team a little bit more flexibility now that we have have the comp, have this confidence in these businesses that we can grow them. Thanks so much for the color. Appreciate it. The next question comes from Jake Bartlett of Truist Securities. Great, thanks for taking the question. Um, you know, my question is is on the limited menu um, at, at all at Olive Garden, and you know, I'm just wondering um, whether there, you have any concern that, that that's impacting the recovery, the pace of the recovery um, at Olive Garden, whether it's impacting sales. I know it's been been great for margins. Um, in, in, in the context of that question, I think there's been commentary from some of the distributors that independents are you know, re-expanding their menus. Um, you know, is 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 there a concern that that as others kind of re-expand the menus that that you guys might be missing out on sales? And then I have a follow-up. Jake, um, I think that you know, I think that the limited menu is not impacting Olive Garden at all. And I'll go back to the context I provided in the beginning. If you just use the break-even on the advertising, um, you know, we'd be we'd be up double digits in this business. Um, and we don't do advertising to break even. And again, we, this, this, the recovery in Olive Garden, I think, has is, is been stronger than, than most. 
And I, I define recovery based on how much profit we make. Um, and I, I keep looking at that profitability number, and I'm, I'm really pleased. So I don't think the limited menu is having any impact on our ability to drive top line in that business. Uh, I'd go back to, to some of the things I outlined in the beginning. As far as independence, um, adding menu items, uh, you know, more power to them. If they think that's what's going to drive their business, let them make those decisions. We're, we're very comfortable where we are with our menus at this point in time. Great. I appreciate that. And, you know, following up on that, you know, selling expense has been about 1% of sales for the, for the last three quarters now. You know, is, is that the right level we should think about for the, for the rest of the year? And maybe, maybe just share any, any thoughts you have on, on longer term, you know, significant change from historical. Um, so, so where should we be thinking, um, you know, the, more than near in the long term in terms of marketing as a percentage of sales? Well, I think for, for the short term, I, think, I don't think you'll see us change our marketing uh, strategies at all or even our, I guess our tactics at all at this point in time. I think longer term, I, th I think I'm going to go back to what I talked about last call, call was we're still waiting to determine what's, where's the equilibrium of this business. You know, what's going to be on-premise? What's going to be off-premise? What's the competitive set look like? Um, this additional kind of ramp up in COVID, I think, is, is stressing out more restaurants. So maybe there's going to be some more closures. I don't know. We don't know. And so we're just searching for equilibrium. And once we get to that equilibrium, um, we'll develop a, a strategy and implement tactics that we think will, will best position our brands to be able to grow profitably into the future. But at this point, for, for us to talk about that and, and kind of say where we think that's going to end up, uh, that, uh, that would be – that's just a huge mistake because we just don't know what environment we're going to be operating in. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Our next question comes from Jeffrey Bernstein of Barclays. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. One, Gene, I think you mentioned in your prepared remarks, you know, specific to August, that trend slowed versus June and July, but still up versus pre-COVID. I'm just wondering how much of that you maybe attribute to the staffing shortage versus maybe the spike from a Delta variant perspective, just trying to gauge the impact from each. And I think you said September was up 7% per operating week versus the first quarter up only 4.8. So I'm just wondering what your assumption is for the rest of fiscal 2Q relative to that September comment, and then one follow-up. Good try, good try, Jeff. I'm not going to comment on forward-looking on sales. Uh, I will. I will just say that. I will say, you know, in our commentary about the trends is, is that, you know, as, as COVID started to pick up, especially in the southeast, and Florida was hard hit. Well, we have a huge footprint. Um, you've got, you had the impact of the Delta variant, and you also had back to school in a lot of these territories at that time. So we're having a hard time teasing out what was seasonality, what was the impact of the, of the variant. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we gave, you know, we're not going to get in the, in, in the habit of giving quarter to date sales at this call, but we felt that there was enough change in, in, the, uh, in the sales environment that we wanted to be explicit that you know, our sales have, have come back uh, a little bit in September after falling, falling a little bit in August. Uh, we think some of that has to do with COVID, some of that has to do maybe there's a little bit less seasonality in the business. Uh, there's so many different variables impacting us week to week, month to month right now. It's very difficult to tease out, and so we're just being as transparent as we possibly can. Uh, we, we know you know where we're at quarter to date, and, uh, and I'm not going to comment on what you know. We've given you guidance for the rest of the year, and that's what that's what we think we're going to be able to do. Understood. And then just the follow up, um, you know, more broadly on inflation. I'm just wondering how you think about the restaurant industry and maybe even retail more broadly. I mean, it just seems like inflation is elevated. All industries seem to be raising prices and not getting much pushback from the consumer. I'm just wondering, maybe in your view, how does this, this end, whether for the industry or just for Darden, when you think about inflation versus pricing in the context of trying to just drive traffic? Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a very good question, right? So I, I think, first of all, I think we could all agree that uh, a lower income consumer is going to be disproportionately impacted by increases in inflation. Uh, and, and that consumer is a big part of our, our guest makeup for our, our casual brand. So we're, we're incredibly focused on, on the longer term 
push back. Not so much short term. I mean, people say, well, we're pushing this off on the guest. No one's pushing back. Eventually, there's going to be pushback. And so we're making a strategic choice, especially in Olive Garden, and I'll say for Cheddar's, is that we're being very cautious with pricing, and we want to make sure that this, this big group of consumers that we service feel as though they can still come to our restaurants and get an extremely you know, great value for what, what they have to pay. Um, and so I think that those who manage through this prudently, those who um, you know, to really take a, a longer look, we'll, we'll get through this okay. I think those who pass through a lot of price um, that aren't really managing their costs of, you know, effectively. I think we've got to really think about how we manage our costs going forward um, because at some point your average consumer could get priced out of casual dining if it costs too much. And I'm, I think I, myself and, my, and, my, and the entire team is really, really concerned about that, and that's why we've made the strategic choice that we've made with pricing. Uh, and so I think uh, we're thinking about how do we position ourselves to excel in an inflationary environment. Our next question comes from David Tarantino of Baird. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, Gene, um, a question on Olive Garden and the performance there, and I, I appreciate all the, the factors that you mentioned on uh, that, that may have weighed on the sales, um, you know, for that brand. But I, I was just curious to get your thoughts on whether you think that was particularly acute in the in the quarter you just reported, and some of those factors could ease as the year goes on, or or how are you thinking about that? Are you are you assuming those factors continue for the rest of the year or, or not? Yeah, I think the, the the one piece of one thing I would add that I did not mention in the comparables for the this first quarter was two years ago we were running buy one take one, which is a you know a significant traffic driving promotion, um, and we believe it you know it does have some profitability uh, tied to it. Um, so that that was weighing on on the comparable performance in, in Q1. You know, I, you know David, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I think that we're looking at Olive Garden more on a um, on a bottom line perspective than just the top line at this point in time. It makes it makes no sense at all for any business today to be out advertising and driving sales into restaurants that aren't you aren't assured that you are 100% fully staffed and can provide a great dining experience. And until we get to that, you know, we feel certain that we have that every single day without having to deal with exclusions. Um, we're not going to get out there and try to try to push people into the into these restaurants. It just makes no sense to me. And so when I when I look at what we're doing in Olive Garden, uh, and I continue to just be thrilled, and 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 they continue to exceed my expectations. Um, and, and it seems as though we continue to disappoint you know, the sell side expectations on this. But this is this is a this is a very very difficult operating environment. And uh, um, I, I think that you know some of those things. If if COVID, if you can tell me what's going to happen with COVID um, moving forward then I can tell you that some of this stuff will ease. But when COVID's still, you know, prevalent in our, in our communities, um, we're going to, you know, we're not going to know what the full potential or what I refer to as equilibrium is for a while. Yep, I understood. And on, on the staffing levels, I just wanted to clarify, I think um, you might have said that you're running at about 90 percent of pre-COVID levels, if I heard that right. Um, what is the targeted level? Um, you know, how does that compare to, to what you would ideally like to be? Because I think you had some efficiency gains that might might lead to, I guess, lower levels than you had pre-COVID um, optimally. But uh, I guess, where, where are you relative to optimal levels? Yeah, David, this is Rick. Um, yeah, I did say 90 percent of pre-COVID staffing levels. Um, assuming the volume that we have today, right? So volume will drive how much staffing you need. So think about that. Um, we probably need somewhere in the single digit number of team members in our restaurants. Uh, we have some restaurants that, that, that need a little bit more because of the uh, location they're in. But as I said, most of our restaurants are fairly well staffed. Um, and so, you know, as the volumes start to increase, 
Uh, we continue to hire. Um, and so it really depends on where the volumes end up. But we don't believe that we would need the same number of people that we did before COVID at the same volume levels with these new menus. Yeah, and, and the other thing that's happening now is we've got team members that are coming into the, into the industry that may not be able to work the same number of hours. So it really all depends on the, the hours that people can work and the days they can work. So staffing levels in, in number of people versus where we were pre-COVID probably isn't the best indicator, uh, but it's a pretty good one. Um, and again, as I said, we, we've been very, we've been increased our productivity. So, you know, all equal, same number of hours for a person, same number of guest count for someone, we would need fewer people. Great, thank you very much. Our next question today comes from Brett Levy of MKM Partners. Great, thanks for taking my question. I guess if we could just go uh, both big picture and then uh, more specific to you guys. Uh, if you could just parse out a little bit more on the competitive landscape, maybe uh, a little bit more on the regionality and what you're seeing out there, as well as if you're willing to share the uh, market share data uh, of how much share you gained in the quarter. And then also, specifically for you, you've had great successes on the margins, uh, both through your planning, but just also through your execution. Where do you see uh, margins really hitting a ceiling? And I guess we can either do that for Darden Consolidated or at Longhorn and Olive Garden specifically. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good morning, Brett. I think, you know, let me just comment on maybe some regionality um, more so than get into the competitive situation. You know, I think that, um, you know, we've been very pleased with how California's come back. Um, I, spent, I spent some time in California this quarter. Uh, it was a lot different than what I thought it was going to be. Um, so I think that our, our sales have, have come back there since the middle of July, uh, very strong. So we're very pleased what's happening out there. You know, we felt some we felt some pressure in Georgia and Florida, you know, over the last six to eight weeks with the Delta variant. Texas didn't have much impact. I mean, Texas seems to have a mind of its own. Um, the Northeast has never really come back um, from from where where it was. It's still performing okay, but hasn't hasn't really rebounded. Uh, and then we got pockets today where you know, where you just you can just look at the heat map for COVID. And you know that you're going to have some you know some sales problems. So you got some Tennessee, Kentucky. West Virginia issues today. Um, but overall, I mean, I, I would say there's not a tremendous amount of difference in, in regionality. Um, you know, as far as mar margins go, you know, the way I, I would think about that is we'll eventually get back to our framework where we think we can, you know, get to 10 to 30 once we, once we figure out where equilibrium is. And, um, you know, I, I'm not, well, I don't think any of us should sit here today and, and say, you know, what's the ceiling or where, where, where do these businesses run long term? Um, we do think that, you know, we've made uh, some really great strategic choices over the last couple of years. We've transformed our business models. We've learned a lot. We've learned a real lot through this on how to be more efficient. And I don't think you'll see us give, give that up. And as long as we can continue to drive the top line, there's no reason why we can't hang on to these margins. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eric Gonzalez of KeyBank Capital Markets. Hey, uh, thanks for the question. I just want to go back to the, the comment about the, the core to date trends. And, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I, I was just wondering if you can maybe talk about the different performances of the different brands. You know, did you see acceleration across, you know, broadly across all your major brands, or was it just, um, you know, maybe specific to one or two of them? And then my, my, my real question here is on the off-premise off business, you know, recognizing that you don't want to overwhelm the staff by drawing in traffic with advertising, I was wondering if maybe there's an opportunity to push harder on that off-premise strategy with marketing promotions, given that channel likely requires less labor. Thanks. Yeah, uh, no comments on quarter to date. I, I, we gave you a number, which I don't like to do, and, and that's, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, as far as off-prem off goes um, and trying to drive that, it's very, very difficult to drive that business specifically without discounting, and we don't want to discount. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, part of the, the labor problems in, in, in dealing with the exceptions ha impacts off-premise, too. It takes less labor, but you still, need, you, still need, you still need your cooks, you still need all these people to produce the food. And so, you know, 
we're trying to, when we think about this, we're trying to create great dress experiences, whether it's on-prem or off-prem. And as Rick outlined in his prepared remarks, dealing with these exclusions, I mean, it's not like we get a lot of notice that we got seven people that are excluded from the, from the restaurant, and all of a sudden you have seven people short for the night. Um, you got you got to you got to adapt and, and 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 try to overcome those challenges, and so you know I think that we're you know we're we're where we're at right now we we are doing some things off premise without discounting, um, you know and and you know on the weekends you know we have to throttle the off premise business in other words we can't you know we've got to control how many orders we do every 15 minutes and each brand has a you know a different different way of throttling each restaurant can throttle differently but on average i'll give you an idea is that we only take four four orders to go every 15 minutes and there are a lot more orders than that um and, and so and you know and i think that that's you know i think that's something that we know we have excess demand but we've got to be able to we've got to be able to service the dining room and service the off-prem from a margin perspective, the exclusion pay, are you able to maybe talk about what that might be just from a, you know, from expense perspective, uh, recognizing that the sales have an impact, but maybe there's an expense there from paying labor that's, that's not present. Uh, it's not, it's not big enough. It's not, it's not meaningful impact on the P&L. Thanks. Our next question comes from Brian Bittner of Oppenheimer and Company. <clears throat> Thanks. Good morning, guys. Uh, just going back to the staffing issues you talked about at Olive Garden that clearly are restricting the sales capacity. When you look at Longhorn, are they dealing with the same or similar issues from a staffing perspective? Obviously, it doesn't look like it when you look through the lens of just looking at the numbers. So if they aren't dealing with those staffing issues, can you just talk about why and the primary difference going on there between the two brands? Hey, Brian, it's Rick. A couple of things about Longhorn. One is they have a smaller total team than Olive Garden does, right? So, um, and they actually were in parts of the country early in the pandemic that opened up a lot faster. So their staffing challenges aren't nearly um, where Olive Garden would be. Um, and actually, right now, they have more team members than they did pre-COVID, uh, but they're doing a lot more volume. So their staffing challenges are really the same thing on exclusions. Um, and, you know, if you think about the exclusions, you know, a lot of it impacts the kitchen. And so, you know, as long as they've got enough people working in the kitchen that they have an exclusion, they can continue to drive sales through that, um, it's not as big an issue for them. So you think about an, a Longhorn, probably 60% of the total team members of a restaurant than an Olive Garden does. And so when you have exclusions, it's not, that, it's not as big of an impact for, for Longhorn. Okay, great. Thanks, Rick. And just with Olive Garden, aside from the staffing issues, how do you want us thinking about your ability to proactively drive the business in the future with more marketing and more promos? Meaning, you know, are you just so pleased with this new profitability profile of Olive Garden that uh, you really want this to kind of be the new base case strategy moving forward and how the brand operates? Or do you want us analysts thinking that you have this unused weapons that you could potentially deploy if you want. No, I think this is, Brian, this is the way to think about it. This is the base business. And what we're going to try to do is once we figure out where equilibrium is, um, we, will, we will develop, you know, a strategy and implement tactics to be able to drive the business profitably. Uh, you know, what we will want to do is, is put back in, you know, another hundred million dollars of marketing and only get four hundred million dollars in sales. And, you know, and then you go back to some of the comments I made earlier is that you know we want to we want to make sure that we're focused on value. Um, you know, we think that you know with this inflation going through, there's going to be a, you know a longer term. There's going to be the the the, the winners are going to be the ones who provide ex, you know exceptional value to the consumer. Uh, and we, we're trying to position Olive Garden to be to be that brand. It's historically done well in downturns, and if we have a downturn, we want to position it to, to do really well. Um, I think we'll promote again. Don't get me wrong. We will promote again. We just think we will do it differently. And we are thinking we think a lot more about the opportunity cost around the value of that table um, when we're extremely busy and how not to have 
um, guests sitting at that table, um, you know, paying less than full price. Even though it's a value uh, proposition, we don't, you know, we, we want to be value and focus on value. We don't want to be discounting off a value platform. And I think that's really important. And so we've got to figure that out once we get there. We, we know we've got some contingency plans right now. And we think we know what we want to do, but we need to see what the competitive environment is and we need to see what the economic backdrop is. Great. Thank you, Gene. Our next question comes from Lauren Silverman of Credit Suisse. Thank you. So just looking at trends across the brands, on a two-year basis, comp accelerated from the fourth quarter in May, all the segments except for Olive Garden. And I appreciate all the commentary on the differences on an absolute basis. But from a sequential perspective, are the dynamics the same? I'm just trying to understand, you know, why just there's no change there. Uh, hi, Lauren. Uh, let's make sure we understand the question. Right? Can you repeat the question? Uh, sure. So just looking at a two-year basis comp for the quarter accelerated from the fourth quarter for Longhorn Fine Dining and the other business, reasonably flat for Olive Garden. So understand all the commentary on an absolute basis on two-year comps across the brands, but just under, from a sequential perspective from the fourth quarter to the first quarter, if there's anything to call out regarding sort of the factors on the acceleration versus for the other brands versus reasonably flat for Olive Garden. Yeah, I mean, I'll just make a couple couple quick things. I mean, when you think about like the other business, we got we got all mostly yard house back um, in the quarter, um, and then fine dining. We got you know we got a lot more you know full capacity back in in, in the second quarter. Longhorn, you know, Longhorn's just you know the steakhouse segment's just you know done extremely well. Um, you know, so I think that's really the big change. Yeah, and I think the other thing is really the starting point is not apples to apples. That's what we keep trying to come back to is Olive Garden had a lot of, you know, we talked about the promotion in Q1. We had a lot of market, you know, the best, one of their best promotions, and we had a lot of marketing dollars in there. So when you're, when you're trying to compare it to the two years ago number, your starting point is off. That's where we would argue that's 10 points lower or more. So if you start with that, Olive Garden accelerated. Uh, and that's where there's some volatility when you look at that uh, by brand because of the promotional differences. Okay, that's very helpful. And then just on loyalty, you've previously, previously tested a loyalty program across select restaurants. I think we've seen a lot of brands implementing them or looking to in the full-service space. Do you have any updated thoughts on the potential for a loyalty program across the system or what you saw in tests as you think about it? Hey, Lauren, it's Rick. Uh, yes, we eliminated, well, we stopped the test of loyalty right when COVID started. Uh, we didn't believe it was the right thing to do during the time that, that we were making sure that we can get our restaurants open and up and running. Um, you know, we, we are working right now on everyday value. You know, as, as we've talked about for Olive Garden, we want to make sure that our, our value perception is, it continues to improve. It's already great um, in all of our brands. And so, you know, right now we we haven't decided to even test again. Uh, that may come down to may may happen someday. Um, but what we don't want to do is provide a loyalty program that provides a discount to the highest value, the highest use consumer. So if we have a loyalty program, we'll work on something that's different. Um, now I will say we were seeing positive trends in our loyalty program before, but that was a that was a points based discounted program that you know, in the long run, we don't think is the right way to do loyalty in the restaurant business. And we can move on to Dennis Geiger of UBS. Great. Thank you. Uh, first, Raj, just wanted to see if you could quantify the impact of the, the Thanksgiving shift on the quarter by chance. Yeah, I would say at a high level, it's probably think of it as about a 1% impact on a two-year basis because we're, we're comparing to pre-COVID. So as you look at it, yeah, think of it as about a point impact. Yeah, okay. a normal. Thank impact. you very much. Great. And then just wanted to come back on the on the technology front. You know, some impressive digital results as it relates to the to the digital mix of, of off-premise. So just wanted to get a sense for you know any additional opportunities that you can share. 
that can support either that, that off-premise business or even the dine-in business as it relates to, to the top line or, or even some additional margin efficiency opportunities. I, I think geofencing is, is kind of an interesting one that you, you've highlighted. So curious if there's anything to share there and how close that might be or, or any other opportunities on, uh, on the tech side. Thank you. Hey, Dennis, this is Rick. Um, you know, just a broad, broad message on technology first is our goal is to implement uh, technology really that reduces friction across every part of the value chain, you know, and while we respond to growing desire for choice and personalization from our guests. Um, they want choice, they want to be personal, they want personal experiences. Um, and so one of the few things that we did in the first quarter, just to give you an idea, we added Apple Pay and Google Pay to OliveGarden.com. We were already able to use PayPal uh, to, to, to pay for your to-go order. And now over 25% of our mobile app transactions are paid via PayPal and these other wallets where it's much more convenient to our guests to pay. Um, we've updated the curbside I'm here experience for our, for our guests when they, when they have to go, still not including geofencing, but it's coming as well. Um, and, you know, we've just started A-B testing for Olive Garden and online, online recommendations um, for, for items. I'm not going to um, talk about what we're doing in, in future quarters, but we have more improvements. You know, we continue to invest in this digital platform. Our goal for guest facing is to lead our segment when it comes to relevance and convenience for our guests. And we will continue to do that. Will we lead the restaurant industry? Uh, no, the, the, the quick service players are gonna probably spend more and do more things in technology, but we're gonna learn what they're doing and see what we can bring to our, to our space. But we are gonna lead the full service restaurant space in technology for guest facing. That's great, thank you. And we can go to Nicole Miller of Piper Sandler. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, two quick ones. On off-premise, can you talk about um, catering as an underlying trend and what you're seeing in catering? Yeah, Nicole. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of pickup back in catering yet. Uh, we did see during COVID more catering to homes than to businesses, but since business uh, spending and, and, and people still haven't gone back to offices, we haven't seen a huge pickup, but we are seeing some. We are seeing some growth in catering but it hasn't been dramatic. Um, you know, we'll see what happens during the holiday season this year, um, but uh, right now, not a huge, huge jump in catering from what happened uh, while COVID was going on. And then just a really high level question around fine dining. Your numbers are up like the industry peers, if not better. What is a fair assessment of some of the pluses and minuses of what we might think about for social or corporate gatherings coming up for the holiday season. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's all going to depend on where we are with this variant and what what the what the levels are, uh, you know, in in, in 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 especially in some of the bigger markets. Um, you know, I I would I'd sit here today and say, I think it's going to be a robust holiday season. I think it's going to be a robust holiday season for, for all our restaurants and all our retail. Uh, I think that the consumer is still fairly healthy from a financial standpoint. Um, and it will, we'll, we'll know more in the next six to eight weeks as we start thinking about, we start seeing the bookings. Um, you know, one trend that we have seen over the last six to eight weeks is we've seen a lot of cancellations of uh, larger parties or gatherings inside the fine dining restaurants as people aren't as comfortable gathering in big groups as they they may have been, um, you know, in the mid midsummer, uh, but I would expect this to be a robust holiday season if the variant is under control. Thank you. We can now move on to Jeff Farmer of Gordon Haskus. Uh, good morning, thanks, guys. Uh, just quickly wanted to follow up on some of the menu pricing and value questions that you guys received. I think you pointed to holding menu pricing obviously well below inflation levels, but that has moved higher for you. So um, I think menu pricing sit at roughly 1.5% the last quarter. Where do you think menu pricing could go this quarter and over the balance of the year, considering that that inflation, total inflation number has ticked up for you? Yeah, hi, Jeff. I'll, I'll speak to the year. What's contemplated in our, in our guidance is pricing uh, just under 2%. So if you think, our, think about our total inflation being 4% uh, in, this, in, the, in the forecast we provided, our outlook we provided, we're assuming pricing uh, just under 2%. Okay, the and year. then that's helpful. And then different topic, 
a uh, lot of your peers, casual dining peers, have been pretty aggressive in taking these delivery menu pricing premiums, which have improved uh, the, the margin structure or profile for that delivery offering. Um, I, I'm, I'm just curious, has that changed your uh, opinion about potentially uh, pursuing delivery, considering that there's a little bit better margin profile out there for that, that, that sales channel? No. All right, easy enough. All right, thank you, guys. Our next question comes from Brian Mullen of Deutsche Bank. Hey, thank you. Uh, just a question on the long-term development opportunity for Olive Garden. Uh, you made commentary in recent quarters, a bit less worried about cannibalization. You might have been in the past more optimistic on the number of units. So this question is, what's your current thinking on the long-term potential here? Is there an actual number you have in mind? Could there be a 1,000 restaurants? Could there be more? Just any color on your updated thinking. Yeah, I don't think we want to put a number. I will say more more than a thousand. We think that there's a pathway to get there. I think it's dangerous to say, you know, I've been in this business, you know, doing this for a long time, and every, you know, every time we run a brand, we put out numbers um, that we think are potential. If the brand is really strong, we 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 kind of get through those numbers pretty easily. Um, so, you know, let's just say we we one of our underlying beliefs is that convenience is going to continue to matter. We're going to need to build restaurants closer to where people live. And we also believe, in, especially in Olive Garden, that we can build in more remote areas that have these large, what I would call these like 60-mile trade areas where people travel in and, in and, in and out to get, get, some, get things and, and, and dine. And so, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about where we can take Olive Garden, you know, especially if we can maintain over 20% off-premise. Um, that, that opens up some, some more trade areas. You know, we just continue to open Olive Gardens and, and amazed, and we continue to be amazed at the volumes we do, and and then the returns that we're getting. So, um, we definitely think we can get over a thousand fairly easily. That's it for me. Thanks for that. Our next question comes from Chris Ockel of Stiefel. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, Gene, I, I wanted to get your perspective on what do you think is driving the industry labor shortage and, and how the industry can create maybe a stronger employee proposition to, to attract talent? Yeah, I don't, first of all, I don't think the labor shortage uh, is just, uh, just, just the restaurant industry. I think it's, it's, a, it's a national problem. I think that we see it with our vendors. We see it in other places. We all have associated maybe with some other companies that we, we see this challenge uh, every single day. So, you know, I, I do think that as we think about the, the restaurant proposition, um, I, I think we have to all understand what, what, what do restaurant team members want? I mean, they want, they want an opportunity to, to be able to work in an environment that is well run. They want flexibility. They want growth, depending on where, you know, what they're using the job for. And a lot of restaurant jobs are passed through. They're kind of, let's get from point A to point B. And I think as, you know, we have to continue to find ways to improve that proposition um, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things that I'm really most proud of is how many people that come into, our, into us as an hourly employee and that we're able to get into management. We got, you know, in the last three or four months, we've got almost 500 team members we've taken from our hourly ranks and moved them into management ranks. And I love, I love that growth. I love that opportunity. When I'm in the field, I, I love to meet these people. And they're just, you know, they're so excited about, about their future and, and their potential. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, I think those who have resources, I think this is where scale is going to matter too. Those who have resources that can create an employment proposition uh, that's stronger than others will attract people. And there's no doubt that, you know, I think that we're in a lot better shape than, than, than others in, in this, you know, with, with, in, in, with labor at this point in time. And I, you know, I, I don't think it's something. I think it's going to come down to being an, an individual situation. Which company, and more importantly, it gets down to the restaurant manager, the GM, and inside each of that box, can they create an environment where people want to work? And that's how we'll attract people. Where we have our best leadership, we do not have people problems. One thing you didn't mention was pay, and I'm just curious if you think continuing increasing pay at kind of healthier rates or the rates that we've seen recently, if you think that'll address the employment issue at all? No, I think, I think you've got to have competitive pay. 
Um, and I think that uh, that's only one aspect of the employment proposition. You know, there's been pressure on wage now for a few years, uh, even before COVID. I think there'll be there'll be there'll be pressure on wage uh, as as we move forward. Um, but I don't think it all comes down to just just pay. I mean, I think if if you, I don't think the problems for the industry go away, um, just just because we're gonna we have to we, if we pay more. Great, thanks. Our next question comes from David Palmer of Evercore ISI. Thanks. Uh, good morning. I, I think the restaurant expense line was down 110 basis points on a two-year basis uh, in the quarter, with uh, comps up 5% over that time. Could you talk about how the company is doing this, and how much of that do you think is sustainable productivity longer term in your view? And I have a follow -up. Uh, hi, David. This is Raj. Uh, Hi, David. Yeah, so um, restaurant expenses per operating week were on an absolute basis were slightly below. I think we're about a point below where we were uh, pre-COVID. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have found some efficiencies through uh, through the pandemic on some contract services and some R&M. I do think some of the costs will come back in a little bit, but it's still going to be uh, a point of leverage. I mean, a line that we're going to continue to see some improvement versus pre-COVID. Uh, is it going to stay at the 110, 120 range? Probably not. Uh, it all de again, also it depends on where the sales are. But we are managing. That, that's one line where we've been able to manage well and keep it, uh, you know, keep it uh, fairly flat, or actually slightly below where we were pre-COVID. Well, um, just a quick follow-up on that part is what are some specific things that are going on there? And then I just a separate question on the marketing and promotion side. I'm wondering how you're thinking about marketing promotion spending as, the, as you see some of these COVID era forces easing, a variety of them. Uh, so more specifically, do you anticipate marketing and promotion spending returning to fiscal 19 levels in fiscal 23? Thanks. Uh, so let me ask, answer the last question first. No, we don't expect it to get back to that in, at this point. Uh, but then the, on, the, on, the, on the restaurant expense line, like I said, it's really contract services. You know, we continue to look at our vendors and, and continue to work with them on how to kind of optimize, streamline some of this, and that's part of that. Uh, there, there was a little bit less R&M that, that has been catching up, and I think by Q1 we're more, more closer to pre-COVID levels on that line. Uh, but there's a little bit more on that line that I think will come back. Uh, but, but beyond that, there's really no specific one item here or there. I mean, there's, you know, there's music, there's other stuff that we talk about, but these are, it's, it's, it's in multiple places. Thank you. Our next question comes from Andy Barish of Jeffries. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, just a couple of um, kind of short-term questions, which uh, I'm sure you'd love. On the September numbers that you talked about, can you just give us a sense of, you know, the noise in the quarter so far? I know there was a Labor Day shift, I think, with two years ago, obviously weather, um, just trying to get a sense of what, you know, what you can tease out given all the other variables. Yeah, hi, Andy. Uh, so we actually don't have a Labor Day shift because our fiscal years, we're, we're, we're giving you fiscal comps and our, our Labor Day, because of the 53 weeks that we had in fiscal 19, we actually have apples to apples for Labor Day. Uh, there was clearly some impact from Hurricane Dorian that uh, about two years ago that we had talked about uh, that impacted the first few uh, weeks a little bit. Uh, high level, maybe a point or so at the time. I, I can't recall exactly, but that's, that's what I'd say. And then just just finally on on the on the margins, you know, sequentially, this is usually a quarter where you see, you know, a couple of hundred basis points of you know of sequential decline in margins, given the volumes are, are usually the lowest. Is that is that somewhat um, predictable this year, or just too tough to tell, given everything going on out there? Uh... <laughs> So I, I, let me answer it without getting to the specifics on that. Q2 uh, is is one where we do think because of the low uh, volumes and low margins to begin with, you're probably going to have a little bit more improvement than than a typical quarter. But but I would say uh, but I would say that 
Q2 is also one quarter where we're probably going to have the highest uh, inflation as we look at where we are sitting, right? So it's going to be higher than Q1 in terms of inflation. Okay, helpful. Thank you. And our next question comes from John Ivanko of J.P. Morgan. Um, hi, thank you. I, I wanted to get back, uh, you know, to labor and staffing in particular. I heard, you know, you were adding 1,000 net new employees per week. I think you said, which obviously is a great achievement. Can you talk about, you know, the quits rate, you know, at Darden, just overall, you know, turnover, and you know, just as you know, you are, you know, kind of hiring a thousand people net, which obviously is much more than that. Gross, um, you know, how you are feeling about, you know, some of the real time operating metrics, you know, that, you know, that you look at in terms of where, you know, those are versus standard and, you know, assuming there might be a tick below, you know, how quickly you think you can ramp back up to where you'd like to be. Yeah, John, this is Rick. On the, on the turnover front, um, we are actually starting to see our turnover get improved dramatically from where it was kind of during COVID and even coming right out of COVID. Um, we're still well better than the casual dining industry in turnover. Um, and especially in the first 90-day turnover, right? And that really is a testament to the training that we're doing to these new team members when they're, when they're coming in. Um, now, turnover is still higher than it was pre-COVID, but it's getting much better, um, and it's still, it's still much better than the industry. And on the operating side? Um, say that again? Uh, sorry, and on the operating side, I mean, you know, considering you are hiring so many new employees, I mean, a thousand net is obviously much more than that gross. I mean, if that, you know, what's that's translating in, term, in terms of some of your real-time operating metrics, you know, relative to the past, and you know, if there's an opportunity to maybe uh, improve on the margin given how new uh, your overall staff is. Yeah, I would say is if you think about the percent of our team members that are in the first 90 days, you know, they're not as productive as the team members that are, that are you know, in, have been with us for a year. And we do have a higher percentage of team members that are with us for, 90, for the first 90 days than we were two years ago. Um, so there are some productivity improvements that we can do for those new team members. Um, and we are spending a little bit more in training than we did two years ago because of that. Um, and so there might be some 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 ch some chance to offset some of those things, but that'll just be that'll just come from inflation down the road. Um, but uh, yeah, operating, we're operating well. All of our operating metrics, if you think about our guest satisfaction metrics, they're still at the same levels they were over the last three or four months, even with these new team members. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Tower of Wells Fargo. Awesome. Uh, thanks for taking the questions. Uh, first, and I apologize if I missed this one, but Raj, did you quantify the headwind that the exclusions had on uh, OG sales during the quarter? And then second, you know, uh, Rick and, and Gene, uh, throughout this call, you, you hit on uh, the benefits of scale and, and how important that is to your overall business. And, and frankly, how well your business has been doing despite the, the challenges that the industry has been facing. I would assume that many of your smaller competitors in the category are, are feeling the pain more acutely than you are. So I, I'm curious, given the benefits of scale your company could bring to the table, has your appetite for adding brands to the portfolio grown at all uh, over these you know, past six months or so? Uh, and we're not, we, we did not quantify the, uh, you know, any impact on sales from the exclusions. That's something that's, you know, we're, we're not, we, we're not, we're not, we can't do that. No, we have the me methodology to do that. You know, as far as M&A goes, I mean, we're, you know, the same place. We're a platform company. Uh, management and the board continue to evaluate options. And when we, you know, when we find an option that we think that makes sense, um, you know, maybe we'll do something. Right now, I would just I'd pivot to say that we're extreme, as I, as I talked about my prepared remarks, we're really focused on growing our existing brands. We love how healthy our, 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 our brands are, uh, vibrant, and how good, strong the business models are. We think opening our own restaurants right now is the, the best way to create value for our shareholders. Got it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Vaccaro of Raymond James. Uh, thanks. Just two quick ones for me. Um, on the quarter to date, can you confirm that um, average weekly sales volumes also improved sequentially 
or was the percent increase kind of more driven by lapping easier seasonal comparisons? September is usually lower back to school. And then Raj, what level of GNA is bedded in your fiscal 22 guidance? Thank you. Okay. Hi, Brian. Um, for September quarter to date, the, the numbers we're referencing are versus pre-COVID. So as you rightly pointed out, there is a seasonality as you come into September. September is, I think, generally the lowest seasonal month for us, uh, for, uh, for us in the industry in the casual space. Uh, but with that said, on the, on the GNA front, uh, like I said, if you take out the 15 million uh, of the unique items that we had this quarter, that would be a good run rate to use as you look forward. Thank you. Our next question comes from Andrew Strauzik of BMO. Great, great. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I just had two quick ones on unit growth and real estate. You know, it feels like uh, similar to yourselves, there's a number of brands that are talking about accelerating unit growth kind of coming out of the pandemic. So I'm, I'm just curious for your perspective on the real estate environment in terms of availability, price. Are you seeing that kind of competition play out? And then secondarily, you know, you, you've given several eloquent answers about, you know, why it makes so much sense to, to, to put up your own new units. I'm just curious why you think three-ish percent is kind of the right level at this point. Thanks. Yeah, um, unit growth, uh, you know, it's it's acquiring sites is just as hard as it was pre-COVID. I mean, it's people are out there competing, not just, you know, restaurants are not just, it's just not restaurants competing for space. I mean, retailers use the, the spaces that we use, banks use the spaces that we use. So there, there are a lot, there's a lot of competition out there. Um, it, it's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely, you know, getting more expensive. Uh, we are seeing construction costs start to moderate. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, having being investment grade credit uh, does help with with landlords um, and how we how we behave through the crisis and how we paid our rent uh, is not forgotten uh, with these landlords. So I think that we we have we have a very exciting you know group of brands to put on pieces of property and people are excited as Darden as the as the tenant. You know, as far as why is 3% where we believe the, the, the right number to be, uh, how that comes down to people. Um, you know, I think that the most important decision we make when running this kind of a business is who's going to be the management team in that, in that restaurant. And we need to make sure we have people that, that can handle that, handle that responsibility. Um, you know, especially in our smaller brands, it's really tough to really ramp up that, that growth because you, you, you rip through your human resources quickly. Every time you open a restaurant, you really have two new general managers. You're taking an existing general manager or managing partner from an existing business, putting them in a new business, and then you got somebody new in the existing business. So you have two businesses at risk. And, 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 and for doing this for the amount of years that I've done it, um, I think that for Darden, 3% growth rate is, is really, you know, maxing out our human resources and our ability to do this correctly. And... You know, it takes a lot to open a restaurant. It takes a real lot to open a restaurant, and we need to do it right. And if you don't open a restaurant right and get it right in that first six months, they tend to be a problem for up to three years. And that's why we're pretty conservative on how we think about this. Great. Very helpful. Thank you very much. We can go to Chris Carroll of RBC Capital Markets. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for the question. So um, you, you offered some commentary around guest-facing technology, but curious to hear your thoughts on investing in technology that helps on the labor side. Um, I believe you mentioned tech related to um, aiding in restaurant operations, but maybe anything else that's related to hiring or related to scheduling, um, any additional detail on tech focused on labor and staffing would be uh, helpful. Thanks. Yeah, Chris, this is Rick. Um, you know, we do in the restaurant facing things that aren't guest facing, you know, our, our primary goal is to improve productivity and simplify processes. We believe we have a, we have a world-class scheduling system um, and that does a great job taking the general manager's forecast and scheduling a great schedule. Um, what, what isn't world-class in it is the user interface for the manager to make it easier for them. Um, so, you know, we continue to do things to make it easier for managers to do things faster so they can get with guests and they can, they can train their team members and be with guests more. Um, we have some things for our team members and, you know, what we've done with To Go in the kitchen, um, 
you know, and we are looking at machine learning and AI to do better forecasting. So there's a lot of things that we're working on, um, especially in the kitchen, making it easier to order and receive product, um, do inventory and those kind of things. On the, on the service side, you know, we are, we are testing a few things that may make it easier for them, but, you know, what we don't want to do is have technology override the experience for the guest. So, um, you know, we'll continue to make these investments in our technology, in our, in our kitchen technology, in our to-go technology um, to help improve productivity. Great. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and, and then just quickly, just following back up on the topic of reduced industry supply from competitor closures, um, just curious if you have any observations you could share from markets where you know, perhaps you saw more competitor closures versus markets where there were less closures, right? Just really just trying to get a sense of, um, you know, to what extent there's been any, or to what extent there has been a benefit from, uh, from uh, industry closures. Thanks. Yeah, I, w I would say the way the, the, there's two ways to think about it. Number one, you know, in your tier one trade areas, you're not going to see a lot of closures, right? So even even an, a, a below average restaurant can make it in a tier one environment unless the rent is too onerous. So you're seeing more of the the, the closures in your in your secondary and tertiary sites, uh, especially on, on from from independents in the casual space and some chain chain restaurants. Um, now, in, in some of the Tier 1 sites, you are seeing some independent closure on, the, on fine dining. Um, now, I believe that those will be the first to, to, to come back. Those are built out as restaurants. They'll get recapitalized very quickly with another chef and another owner. So I, I do think those will come back. But, you know, I, I would summarize this by saying you're not seeing it in your Tier 1. You're seeing it more in your tertiary areas where you're seeing a lot of closures. Got it. Okay, thanks for all the detail today. That concludes today's question and answer session. Mr. Kalakak, at this time, I will turn the conference back to you for any additional or closing remarks. Thanks, Kevin. That concludes our call. I'd like to remind everyone that we plan to release second quarter results on Friday, December 17th, before the market opens with the conference call to follow. Thanks and have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's conference call. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>